The defense manual is, is the first manual of its kind, um, and it's designed to address a gap in information and knowledge, uh, particularly for lawyers in the global south, uh, who, get, who receive very little training, who have very little access to information about um, the, the best practices for the representation of people who are facing the death penalty. So the manual is intended to provide guidance to lawyers from the very beginning of their representation throughout the appeals uh, through their national courts and also appeals to international bodies. So the very, very first time that they're assigned to meet with a client who is facing the possible imp imposition of the death penalty, they can open the manual and know what to do. We know legal systems are very different across the world, um, whether you're in English-speaking countries, in Latin countries or Asian countries, it's always very different. Are there really uh, some principles, some uh, guidance that can be useful across the world? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, what we're seeing is, first of all, in the manual, we rely heavily on international jurisprudence but also national jurisprudence from a variety of different courts around the world. So we have ex expressly taken into account the different kinds of practices in civil law and common law jurisdictions. Um, while um, some lawyers may find that certain parts of the manual are more helpful than others, um, because some lawyers may find that in their own jurisdiction they have particular rules that they have to follow. The principles, the general principles, uh, should be relevant to all lawyers. And one example is the prohibition against cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment. This is something that is a core international human rights principle that has been interpreted by international bodies and national courts around the world. And what constitutes cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment in the United States is no different than what's cruel, inhuman, or degrading in Botswana. Um, it's, it, it, we're talking about human rights, human dignity, uh, and these are universal concepts. How do you think um, defense lawyers across the world can use this manual? Um, do you think it's something that they can have uh, in their pocket <laughs> look up during a, a hearing? Uh, do you think this is something that could be available in bar associations around the world, in, in law schools? How do you think it will be concretely present in the legal system? I think it could be used by um, legal clinics in law schools as well as in public defender offices, in legal aid offices. Um, I think bar associations should also have it. The idea is that every lawyer who is handling a capital case would have access to this manual and to the guidelines that it provides. Ideally, this would be the manual would pro provide a basis for um, for additional trainings as well, uh, because lawyers can learn a lot by reading a manual. But it would be best if that were also accompanied by. Um, interactive trainings and seminars where they could then ask questions. Did you identify some really precise needs, um, people lacking some skills or some information to defend uh, people who are liable to face the death penalty? What is the, the real focus of this manual? Um, maybe some examples of tips you're giving in there that you've identified as crucial. Um, I think there are two things that I would identify as the most important, um, the most important um, deficiencies in the representation of people facing the death penalty and that were the inspiration for this manual. The first is that many lawyers around the world don't take the time to meet their clients before the day of trial. Um, this is something that is so basic. Um, it is so fundamental, and yet I think in most cases where people face the death penalty, the lawyers don't even go to the prison to meet with their clients. Um, and it's impossible to defend somebody adequately if you have never met with them. You don't know whether the person has an alibi defense. You don't know whether they have a self-defense claim. You have no way of developing that evidence. Um, it really limits your ability to defend a person effectively. And in fact, if your client is innocent, 
the chances are he's going to be convicted if you haven't met with him and if you haven't done your homework. So that was the first, um, the first thing that, that I noticed and that I found so shocking. Um, the second thing is that we have seen the development around the world um, of, a, of, a, of a notion, of a concept that before someone is sentenced to death, they have the right to present what we call mitigating evidence. And mitigating evidence is information about the facts of the offense, but also the individual circumstances of the accused person that make him less morally culpable for the crime. This is not a defense. This is not a legal justification or excuse. It's an explanation. And it involves uh, researching and understanding the person's uh, mental health. It, un it, it involves researching and understanding their life history and the circumstances of their lives that led them to the place where they may have committed a serious crime. Providing that information to the court saves lives because once the court or a jury understands a person and they can empathize with a person, um, it's impossible for them to sentence him to death. So that is a very, very fundamental concept that in many countries they, lawyers still don't understand.